good morning to everyone in Europe uh, and good afternoon or good evening uh, to all those joining from the East. Thank you for uh, joining us for today's webinar. My name is Catherine Austin and I'm the Marketing and Communications Director at iTech. I'll be moderating the webinar um, and first providing a quick introduction before our expert speakers get started. So today we're going to be focusing on current market trends um, and exploring the role of clean technology in the shipping industry post pandemic. In order to do that, we've gathered representatives from three SME clean technology companies uh, to give their perspectives. Um, and this is specifically from the fields of anti-fouling technology, propulsion optimization, digitalization and hydrogen fuel cells. So the webinar today is going to be 75 minutes in duration. Uh, for the first 10 minutes, uh, we will be treated to uh, market outlook insights, uh, which will give us a taste of how the pandemic and global economic activity has impacted different segments of the international shipping industry. After that, our clean tech experts will each make a 15 minute presentation, which will allow them to take a deep dive into their into their technology area um, and its challenges and opportunities both during the pandemic and post pandemic. Then to top it all off, uh, we're going to open the floor uh, to an interactive question and answer session uh, for 15 minutes. Um, for that question and answer session, um, please post any questions that you have for the speakers into the Q&A box in your control panel. Um, you can do that at any time during the webinar. So I would like to introduce our speakers uh, for the webinar today. Uh, as I mentioned, we have three experts. Uh, so the first expert is uh, Philip Shaban, who is the CEO of the Swedish biotechnology company iTech. iTech uh, is a company that has introduced the first ever bio biotechnology that is added into marine anti-fouling paints. Uh, Selectope is well known for being highly precise and highly effective at literally repelling barnacles away from the ship hull uh, without killing them. Uh, our second expert is Mikhail Lorin. Uh, Mikhail joined Lean Marine as their CEO in 2018. Lean Marine's core competency is designing and manufacturing automated fuel saving and data analysis solutions for vessels. Prior to becoming CEO at Lean Marine, Mikhail was CEO of the Lorin Maritime Group of Companies, um, which, is a, a, which was an established operator of MR chemical and oil tankers. Uh, and then last but not least, our third expert is Johan Berggren, um, who is the business manager at PowerCell Sweden, uh, and he has held that role since 2017. He has over 20 years experience in marine sales and the development of maritime engine technology. Um, and at PowerCell, he works specifically uh, in their marine segment to develop and deliver megawatt hydrogen fuel cell systems for use by the global fleet. Uh, so with those short introductions complete, um, I'm going to hand over to Mikhail Lorin, who will deliver our ma ma market outlook section. Thank you, Mikhail. If we don't manage to answer your question, uh, please be assured that we will get back to you with an answer from our experts after the webinar. And finally, if you encounter any technical issues during the webinar, please chat to us, um, or should I say Denise, who um, is sitting in the background managing this webinar. Um, you can do that using your chat function um, and it's closed so no one can see what you post. Uh, so, I'd like to uh, quickly introduce you to our expert speakers. Um, so Philip Shaban is the CEO of the Swedish uh, biotechnology company iTech. Um, iTech is a company that has introduced the first ever biotechnology into the marine anti-fouling paint industry. Um, their technology Selectope is well known for being highly precise, highly effective, um, at literally repelling barnacles from the ship hull um, without any fatal effect. Uh, Mikhail Lorin uh, joined Lean Marine as their CEO in 2018. Uh, Lean Marine's core competency is manufacturing um, and designing automated fuel saving and data analysis solutions for vessels. 
prior to uh, becoming CEO at Lean Marine, uh, Mikau was the CEO of the Lauren Maritime Group of Companies, um, an established operator of MR, chemical and oil tankers. And finally, uh, Johan Bergren uh, has been the business manager um, at PowerCell since 2017. Um, he has over 20 years experience in marine sales and the development of maritime engine technology. At PowerCell, he specifically works in the marine se uh, segment uh, to develop and deliver megawatt ma uh, marine hydrogen fuel cell systems for use by the global fleet. So with those short introductions complete, let's kick off the first session um, and I'll hand over to Mikhail Lorin, who is kindly going to deliver the market insights. Thank you, Mikhail. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. I'm going to say a couple of words on the market and to give us sort of a framework to work from. And of course, Talking about the market in this time is not going to be complete without mentioning the corona pandemic. We have definitely seen a huge shift in the market from the plans I believe we all made at the end of last year till we are now. Looking at the IMF forecast for GDP growth earlier this year, it was mainly green, meaning positive growth in most of the world with a very few exceptions. If you take that same screen or same forecast and look at it today, it looks extremely different. And what we're seeing is that the world is coming into a deep recession uh, very quickly. We're seeing job losses on an uh, unprecedented scale in the US and also in other countries naturally, but it's been more dramatic there. Uh, and it's a very, a volatile market for everybody going forward. So looking at with that in mind, the question in, on everybody's mind is, of course, how long will this last? How long will it stay? Well, if you listen to the IMF, their belief is that we're going to see a worldwide uh, recession with negative growth this year on GDP. But they're still optimistic on 2021, where they believe that we'll bounce back up with an almost 6% growth during next year. There's, of course, a lot of things that can affect this. But looking at the numbers is still fairly, a fairly optimistic view that we'll be more or less back on track. Uh, not really back on track where we were, but at least getting back in line during uh, winter and next year. So how does this affect the markets our three companies are operating in? Well, first, before we go into that, we need to mention the oil price because we had something of a perfect storm as well when Russia triggered a price war uh, in early March before the pandemic really became the global economic issue. And that has since been combined and uh, exaggerated by the demand going down quite dramatically. So what we've been seeing during the spring is that price for oil has dropped dramatically, which of course changes the markets for, uh, for example, tanker market, but it also changes the cost structure for most shipping companies since, well, most of them are running on fossil fuels and the oil price is affecting the price of that. Looking at how this affects specific segments, if we start with a container trade that has been affected pretty badly and was actually the first one to be affected with China being a huge exporter on containerized uh, tra uh, cargo. So seeing, seeing the drop early on there has affected the container market adversely and they're still suffering with lower volumes. They've of course also had issues like all shipping segments with getting in and out of port, getting things loaded and discharged. So they've been very hard hit by this, uh, both on the freight rates and more importantly on the volumes. If we also talk a bit about the dry market, the dry mar bulk market is in a similar position where they've been hit hard, mainly due to the lower production levels we're seeing. So the demand for iron ore and for other uh, 
base cargoes, bulk cargoes, has dropped dramatically. And we are seeing a lot of ships being idle and freight rates have plummeted pretty, pretty, pretty low. So the dry market is also suffering quite a bit from this. Moving on to the cruise market, they have had a PR disaster, to put it mildly, with the fact that a couple of cruise ships have been stuck with um, sick patients on board and they haven't handled it properly in some cases and in many cases they haven't been allowed to get ashore and get the shore help they need. So there's been a lot of negative press for the cruise industry. Uh, and we believe that that's, well, we definitely see that that has, their market has basically collapsed at a time where it's been very good for a long time and they've made huge investments in new, uh, new ships. So we know that they're slowly opening up the cruise market for bookings again and bookings are going up, but we believe it's going to be a very slow market for the cruise industry. And this, of course, goes for the ferry and partially for the rubber road packs industry as well that have been adversely affected by the traveling going down basically to zero between countries and pleasure traveling going down as well. Last segment I'm going to mention is the tanker industry that has been, had a fantastic boom during the late winter and spring. And the boom has been due to two things. Uh, partially that the oil price going down and partially the demand going down. Because those two things have created an environment where there's been an incentive to buy cheap oil with the hope that you can sell it at a higher price later on. So that led to a lot of storage and also a lot of trading in between regions with different price levels. And the price war also led to production being high while demand has dropped. So there is a lot of produced oil and very little storage. I believe store shore storage is more or less full everywhere by this time. And then the option is to store it on ships uh, afloat. And that has led to a fantastic boom for large crude carriers especially, but also for other type of tankers. So they've had a really good time during the spring, a really good market. It has recently, the last couple of weeks, dropped down dramatically, but still to fairly comfortable levels. And the forecast for the year is that it's going to stay reasonably uh, or pretty okay as a market. But again, this means we have a lot of tankers lying still as floating storage today. And there I hand back over to you, Catherine. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Mikhail, for that insight. Um, and please remember to post any questions that you have for Mikhail on that mar market outlook um, into the Q&A box of your control panel. Um, and we'll put them to Mikhail um, after the presentations are complete in our Q&A session. Um, Okay, so now that we know uh, what is happening in the shipping market, um, let's move on to the role of clean technologies um, in supporting the industry uh, to maintain commercial buoyancy during the pandemic and beyond. Um, there's a lot of uh, opportunities uh, for clean technologies um, as well as challenges, but uh, let's take a look at those. Um, so while the COVID-19 pandemic um, has put many of the uh, sectors of the industry in timeout mode, um, as Mikhail was uh, just describing. The same cannot be said for biofouling. Um, the hundreds of vessels that have been rendered idle uh, due to the pandemic are at great risk of biofouling, um, and barnacle fouling in particular uh, can really erode profit margins uh, when vessels recommence service um, after being in warm layup. Uh, therefore, I'd like to welcome Philip Chaban. Uh, from iTech uh, to take us below the waterline um, to share his expertise on biofouling prevention and anti-fouling technology. So uh, over to you, Philip. Hello, thank you. Uh, the, so I'm um, uh, Philip fr from iTech. I'm heading the, the company since uh, 2014. Uh, a very exciting journey in which I will uh, uh, present some insights to, to what we're doing and also the, the relevance and opportunities in these uh, quite different 
uh, days that we're living through now. Uh, short on, on iTech, which was uh, very nice introduced by, by Catherine. Uh, it's a biotechnology company. It, ha it uh, has one product. Selectope uh, is our product, uh, and it's an active ingredient. It's introduced into marine coatings to provide a tremendous uh, uh, static performance in terms of resisting uh, barnacles from settling on a surface. Barnacles settle on a surface when when a ship, in this case, then is uh, at static, and hence it is highly relevant for those who have uh, longer uh, static periods and unpredictable trade routes. It's picked up by several big paint makers, which we'll come back to. So it's been used in service for some time, and it's uh, regulatory approved, which is an uh, uh, important feature in, in uh, this domain. Uh, and it's also compliant with IMO guidelines. So uh, takeaway here is uh, our product Selectope, which we will uh, have as a leading theme throughout the next slides. Uh, so the short agenda for, for my 15-minute uh, speech here is uh, related then to uh, uh, what Catherine introduced us to, the hull and its uh, situation uh, during uh, the different business times under the COVID-19. Uh, idling, as been introduced, is a key issue and therefore quite relevant for, for my topic here. Uh, there's also a sustainability agenda that, that we don't we cannot forget. It's been pushed away from media, uh, of course, because of all the other things, but it is there and it's uh, going to come back very strong and very clearly. And uh, all these three presentations have a very clear uh, opportunity here when it comes to bringing back the sustainability agenda. And finally, I, I will elaborate a little bit on, on oil price and the, generally that is a, a challenge for, for a, a sustained tech companies who are developing themselves into a market with the with a aim of saving fuel. Uh, of course, that is a relevant topic that we will touch upon. So uh, I look forward to run through these slides and uh, uh, let's get on to the first uh, item which is then directly related to the idling uh, of ships that are is now increasing due to the lack of needs of transporting goods. Uh, we have tried to figure out how much uh, or how many ships are idling, which is very difficult, of course, but there are certain articles that are, that are clearly hinting that uh, so-called warm layup is ongoing uh, in all different uh, um, uh, vessel segments ranging from uh, from uh, uh, container ships to, to, to dry bulks and so on, and, and maybe even for uh, floating uh, storage purposes. Uh, maybe not warm layup, but longer idling periods. In the last financial crisis, crisis there were around 1,000 vessels uh, uh, reported to be at warm layup, and warm layup means uh, that they, they need to be back in service six months from, from the point where they, they notify uh, class. And that's a significant time when it comes to idling and when it comes to biofouling. So let's look on what biofouling, uh, the process of it, right? What it is and, and at what uh, time things happen. Initially, uh, any surface is conditioned directly by uh, macromolecules being uh, proteins or, or sugar, and that is instantaneous. Uh, at, at the next step, there is a, a microbial biofilm created uh, with, with uh, normally one cell organism, uh, in creating a little bit of a thicker uh, slime layer, if you wish. Uh, and that is also occurring very quickly. So, so we're talking hours here. And looking then at the next level of, of time slots within days, weeks, and months, we see that uh, secondary colonizers come in after days, uh, now creating a bigger problem for, for uh, hull resistance uh, through water, so to say. Uh, and uh, not to mention, of course, uh, uh, territory colonizers being uh, barnacles coming in only within weeks. Uh, of course, this depends a bit on, on seasonality and so on, but, but uh, a, a general estimate is that within weeks so that there will be barnacle fouling on, on a hull. Uh, and if the idling goes on for long and there's no relevant protection, uh, the, the hull will look like a football field, right? It's uh, a severe fouling of all kind of uh, organisms and animals. So animal fouling will be quite dominant after some time. 
uh, temperature is something that uh, acts here as an accelerator. So the warmer uh, waters and the warmer uh, conditions, the, the faster it goes or, or the more, more severe it becomes at least. The way to prevent this is anti-foulings and that's the reasons why anti-foulings are used. And uh, the better they are, the more they resist this. And there's no shortcuts here. It's not so that uh, there are any, any cheaper solutions uh, that, that can be found to, to act uh, in a good way to, to resist this. This is clearly a, a key area where knowledge has to be brought in when specifying the coatings. Uh, we have seen uh, through um, a report that a lot of ships, despite the idling that we're now talking about, i.e. before all this happened, are quite uh, uh, heavily fouled on a general basis. So, so I have a sample size of, I think, 200 vessels. The findings were that 44% had more than 10% surface coverage of barnacle fouling. And that is quite a lot. And on the next slide, I'll show you what possible impact that has on, on, uh, on, uh, on the resistance through water, hence uh, the fuel bill. So this report has been brought to us by, by Safina Group. So it's an independent report of, uh, as I said, about 200 uh, dockings. So ex linking this to the previous slide, the problem is not academic, it's real. Uh, and it's ongoing in all oceans around the world. Uh, to give you some more insights to that, we have some pictures here showing what we're talking about. So, so barnacles is in these hard, hard uh, uh, creatures, uh, normally called public enemy number one because they cause so much drag problems. And if you're a small boat owner, they, they give you a headache when maintaining and uh, for winter storage. These things create a lot of uh, resistance uh, on a ship. And uh, ONR, which is an uh, uh, academic institute linked to the US Navy, has, has tried to quantify uh, the impact of, of heavy fouling or, or various degrees of fouling. Uh, so, so only at low surface coverages, like 10%, the, the increased power that needs to be applied to the shaft to maintain a 15 knot speed, uh, as an example here, is 36%, which is then linear to the increase of fuel consumption required to keep that speed. So this is at a very severe problem uh, already starting off at light to medium fouling. So what the images you see here are, are, are represented on ships that has for some time been operating with a far from optimal hull condition and has lost a lot of uh, money on, on, uh, on this fuel, extra fuel consumption. So we have now spoken about the effects of idling, which are very obvious and very clear and quite well documented. Now there are underlying opportunities uh, here uh, in this industry. Uh, we don't hear about it in the media anymore, but just until uh, New Year's, uh, there was a lot of talking about the biofouling and, and uh, the effect that could have on spreading invasive species. That is uh, um, driven by uh, IMO on a guideline per perspective, but on, uh, on a regulatory basis, on a nation by nation or port by port. And there has been uh, vessels being rejected to enter ports because they have, uh, have had too much fouling and hence opposing a too high risk of transporting invasive species into their uh, ecosystems. So that has been obviously a, a very bad experience for a few ship owners. Uh, we also had a discussion up until New Year's so very clearly in the maritime media about sulfur cap and introduction of low sulfur fuels or, 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 or cleaning devices such as scrubbers. This is still on. Uh, we don't hear about it, but it's still on. Uh, Scrubbers are being installed and a lot of ships are converting to, to low sulfur fuel or MGOs to stay uh, on the right side of regulations. And this is a global regulation that won't disappear. Uh, of course, it is in this context extremely important to be even more careful with how you maintain your, your operational excellence as uh, low sulfur fuel is very expensive. Uh, normally, uh, the deviation is 50% towards uh, traditional fuel. But also if you install scrubbers, you increase your fuel use because uh, a lot of energy is used to, to run the scrubber. So uh, operational excellence, and in my case then, I'm very concerned that uh, people select premium and high performing anti-fouling coatings uh, simply for these reasons. And these are independently of any economical situation. Um, 
finally there is a small picture on an iceberg and saying that there is just to remind that uh, the whole industry has agreed to, to cut CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, to, to try to reduce the, the warming of the oceans uh, and eventually having those icebergs disappearing. So three very big uh, drivers here uh, that, that are underlaying but won't uh, disappear and likely will come into light very soon again. Uh, we know that shipping is a very big part of the marine industry, about 80% of the goods are shipped uh, on, on, on water. And if we don't do anything, those uh, and if the economy go back to normal, uh, the, the emissions of carbon dioxide into the, to the air will be very high. There needs to be technology put in place. I mean, if you take the analogy to the, to the COVID virus, we need to flatten out the curve, so to say, and we need to drop uh, the, the number of cases, uh, the, the, the spread, and the same thing here. We need to uh, reduce the emissions here to air, and that's uh, in shipping related to introduction of technologies. So uh, we're all three of us speaking about technologies that make a tremendous difference here. And for the hull in particular, it's about 100 million tons of CO2 saving potential per year. Together with my other co-speakers, we can make a tremendous difference. And they're both available, all three available and approved. So uh, there is uh, good hope here that things can be improved. Uh, there's a lot of media coverage here on, on uh, regulation, as I, I mentioned on the, on the previous slide. Uh, so I'll skip this uh, slide, but it's uh, to demonstrate that uh, as uh, so at some point, uh, these uh, headlines will come back into play and, and emphasize the need of becoming cleaner, more environmentally friendly and, and a more sustainable industry. Uh, we also have some uh, recent images from various sources uh, of the environmental effects of not uh, transporting, not uh, producing, right? It's a lockdown uh, scenario, which is, has a lot of difficult uh, um, Outcomes, of course, for people and humanity, but from an environmental perspective, the, there is clear uh, improvements. Uh, some of these may be modified a bit, uh, depending on the source, but it's clearly so that people have been seeing uh, a different sky now than before. Uh, and we doubt that they will accept, uh, and humanity will accept to go back to, to what we had before. Uh, so there will be a social, uh, economical, social political drive force which will be stronger than before to, to cut emissions and become more sustainable. Um, the third point is oil price, right? And, and uh, many people say to, that uh, low prices now are, are, are uh, uh, you know, the, on a level that it doesn't really matter what you do on, on the investment side in fuel efficiency because uh, the, the return is quite bad. But it's a temporary thing. I'm convinced that it's uh, very temporary. And if you look historically on on uh, on uh, VTI prices, which is not fuel bunker oil, I know, but to, to make some analogy, it's a sharp variation from uh, between quite few years. And all these investments that we're talking about here are on a five-year scale or longer. So uh, to 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 take decisions on short-term low oil prices is likely not a very good idea. And the international shipping is uh, consuming 88% of of uh, the total uh, fuels uh, used in, in marine uh, industry, some 300 million tons. Uh, so it's a very important figure to control if you're operating a fleet of ships. And uh, as I said, uh, we have to look uh, on these investments in a five-year horizon or more. Um, and in that case, low temporary oil prices uh, will likely not play a role. At least that's what we hope. Uh, hull performance uh, is very important. All prominent paint makers supply excellent uh, premium uh, grade uh, fuel saving anti-fouling coatings. Some of them use Selectope in an increasingly uh, higher amounts to, to make them even better. So it's all about keeping fouling away. That's the investment case. And the longer you do that, the more the better the ROI becomes. In this case, we, we take the example of, of having ships idling for up to uh, in the worst case, uh, six months, of course, but they, they idle for a significant time, uh, which will have a high likelihood of causing a 10% surface coverage of medium fouling, which we saw from the previous slide is, is, uh, is estimated to cause a 34% uh, fuel increase compared to normal uh, conditions. So uh, 
only after 60 days sailing, there's a saving of, of around $190,000 for a, a ship consuming about 40 metric tons of, of fuel at normal conditions, even at the low oil price of $216, uh, $216 uh, per ton of fuel. 60 days is not so much. It's maybe the time you need until you can clean the ship or find other solutions to, to, to combat your problem. And knowing that investment in, in most of the premium range uh, uh, high-tech uh, antifoul coatings is a markup of maybe $100,000, $150,000, depending on, on, on ship, of course, and, and, and on, on the product and, and the supply relations. Uh, it is a clearly interesting business case, at a, even in short perspective, at these low oil prices. Imagine then going back to the normal oil prices, and if you're then back in a, in a situation where there will be a, a short period of, of longer idling, it is an obvious case. So uh, return on investments can, uh, is attractive no matter what. And, and here we, we claim then that even uh, at 60 days sailing uh, after these longer idling times, that there is uh, a positive ROI provided that the most uh, powerful and, and appropriate anti-fouling coatings are, are used. Not taking then into account the risks of, of having problems with uh, port calls for invasive species transfer risks. Uh, finally, I just want to highlight uh, the type of product that uh, we obviously recommend people to, to consider uh, when you go into the investment case of best possible anti-fouling coatings. There are here a few uh, different uh, examples from Shogoku Marine Paints having a few uh, very advanced and high performing coatings. We have Yoton uh, equally with extraordinary interesting uh, anti-fouling coatings containing selectope being uh, very well adapted for long idling periods and, and are making their way into the new building segment uh, for, for uh, supporting the outfitting period at least. Um, and then we have Hempel who also has uh, a highly advanced anti-fouling system for, for coping with long idling periods. So there are a whole bunch of nice products by the most leading uh, anti-fouling producers who have combined the Selectop technology with their own proprietary uh, technology. Uh, resulting in very attractive uh, uh, anti-fouling coatings from a performance and ROI perspective in the long run. Final slide is just a uh, key takeaways. Uh, trade patterns is proven to be tough to predict. We cannot uh, uh, predict that well anymore. Things happen quite often. If it's not a trade war, it's a virus. If it's not a virus, it's an oil, oil, uh, oil war or oil, uh, oil price hiccup, so to say. There are a lot of different things coming into play that makes it uh, very difficult to predict uh, trade routes and operating patterns. Regulations are obvious, and I mentioned they, they may not be in the media so much now, but there will be uh, a revamp of this very, very soon. Uh, finally, uh, we don't believe that the oil prices will remain, but even if they do, there is an attractive ROI and a high degree of, of interest to keep your eyes on these technologies that's being presented to you today. So by those words, I, I thank you on behalf of iTech and, and uh, uh, look forward to listen to my fellow colleagues here. Super, thank you, Philip. Um, that was really interesting. Um, so thanks for uh, presenting that information um, for us. Uh, please remember um, to post any questions for Philip into uh, the Q&A box. Um, and next up, we're going to uh, delve into the realm of propulsion optimization um, and digitalization. Uh, since there's some instant efficiency gains that can be deployed in a short term scale for all ship types. Um, in fact, we're not going to just be hearing about digitalization as we may know it. Um, we're actually going to learn how moving beyond digitalization uh, can achieve ultimate vessel efficiency. So um, I'd like to welcome back uh, Mikhail Lurin uh, from Lean Marine. Uh, the floor is yours, Mikhail. Thanks. Thank you very much, Catherine. And thank you very much, Philip, for an interesting presentation. Yes, we're going to be talking a little bit about going beyond digitalization for performance monitoring. And before getting into that, I just want to say a couple of things about who Lean Marine are. Uh, we consider ourselves to be maritime experts with a passion for innovation and an inner urge for change. And that means we are really wanting to make a change in the marine industry. And our call to, uh, to action is that we make it happen. So that's how we define ourselves. And the question, of course, is 
what have we made happen so far? Well, so far we have 175 plus ships with our systems on uh, or being installed on, 40 different customers, and uh, we calculate that we save about 162 million kilos of CO2 emissions every year, uh, which is a fairly large amount of CO2 saved, which we're very proud of. So very shortly, that's what we do. I'll get into our products a little bit later on. But firstly, we have a title called Going Beyond Digitalization for Performance Monitoring. And there I just want to stop a little bit because we see two big trends right now for this coming decade with the new rules coming up, as Philip mentioned, one in 2030. One big trend is, of course, fuel economy and environmental issues for the shipping industry, where the shipping industry has been lagging a little bit behind other industries, but is now doing a lot to catch up and basically get more fuel efficiency in how we operate and the technical aspects of shipping. The other part for this decade, I believe, is digitalization. Another area where the shipping industry has been very traditional and been somewhat slow to pick up new technologies, but we're seeing a lot of things happening. And I believe that this is gonna be a very big trend for this year. Shipping is gonna be very different at the end of this decade than it was going into it. Looking at the slide in front of us, we see two extreme bridge systems. A little bit to, uh, to show what I mean with this. On the left-hand side, you see a very traditional bridge, basically built up by a shipyard. Everything's in a straight line. None of the connection features and none of the advanced technology we might be expecting. While on the right-hand side, the bridge is integrated, big screens with all the different features and tools integrated and speaking to each other. And that is something we are moving towards. We see some fantastic new ships coming out with beautiful bridges where all the tools are laid out and interconnected. So how would this look if you look at it a little bit more schematic? This is one example of how you could connect the different systems on your ship. Here you have the voyage planning and navigation with a lot of different data coming into this. You have your weather and external factors coming in. You have your vessel data, how the engine pumps, uh, cargo systems, etc., are working, and that all of that data is being connected on, uh, on a data platform. And having all the data in the same platform means that you will reduce the need to enter data twice, and you will have all the data to be able to analyze it, get the reports done more automatically, and of course, be able to see fleet performance on a different scale. Now, this is sort of an ideal example. If you look at most ships, what you see is something like this today, uh, where the systems are separate, not really talking to each other, data is not interchanged, meaning there's extra work for the crew to enter the data in the different systems, and of course, you will be lacking in your performance monitoring system and your reporting system, because you will not get as good uh, basis for decision as you would like to. Just to show another one, this is something we see often where you started connecting the system. And this is a process. For many ships, you have many different systems on board that need to talk to each other. Getting everything connected at once will take time. We are lacking APIs and sort of uh, rules and regulations for how they should speak to each other. But we are seeing movement forward on this. So, question comes in, how much data do you need? Uh, where you can have on the left-hand side, have a uh, standard old type ship, noon reports with manual readings, which of course is error prone. You will have small or big differences in timing, in the values you get, and you have very little data. And you won't have all the data connected in one place. So what you need to have is an automation of data collection, where you all of a sudden you can have a better analysis, you can start getting results where you can filter out bad weather, distort other factors that uh, distort the data, 
and create best practices from what you see. All of a sudden, with that, you can start comparing different ships that are on different trade lanes, but where you can filter out and get decent analysis of it. And then, of course, we have the buzzword big data, which we had in the title as well. What is big data? Well, that is so much data, so uh, you can actually put a computer or a AI or machine learning or deep learning algorithm to analyze the data and find patterns. Getting there enables the systems to do a lot for you. They can actually find connections. They can see things which are very difficult for a human, even with the help of machines, to find. So you can learn a lot more and get more predictive systems by having big data and an AI system. But of course, having data won't really make you happy, most likely. You need to turn the data into knowledge. And that is one of the big tricks or one of the big things where thing we're moving forward. Uh, getting actually useful reports out of these huge amounts of data signals that are being connected being able to visualize that clearly. So anyone or different roles can go in and get the data they need easily presented. So what do you need all this data for? Well, some things are very evident. Of course, you want to have data to see how you're doing. If you can measure it, you can manage this is an axiom that I live by, meaning that if you don't know, if you can't get numbers on how you're doing, you're flying blind a bit. So you need to be able to measure your performance to be able to see how you can improve. And also when doing improvement measures, you need to be able to see, did it help? Did it make any difference? And if so, how much? Uh, you need to also need data reporting. There's a lot of reporting going on in the world. In the shipping industry, there's, uh, all ports require immense amounts of data. The more you can automate that, get those reports done uh, by the data that are already in the systems, instead of having manual to collect it, the more time you save. Voyage planning is a big thing. When you start getting the feedback of your last voyage and can see, okay, this is what we did on the last voyage. That was better than the voyage before that. The things we changed are this. So let's keep those parameters, but something changed in the adverse direction for fuel economy or the economics of the voyage. Then you can learn from that and get a learning curve going or get a learning circle where you actually learn from what you're doing. You can test things and get your plans uh, planned for the best possible voyage. Of course, benchmarking can lead to that. And there's also use for big data for uh, maintenance planning. So again, if you can measure it, you can manage it. But how do you get efficient right away? Well, Lean Marine is offering two tools that will help you with that, FuelOpt and Fleet Analytics. And FuelOpt is a system that gathers data on board and gives you tools to, uh, to run the propulsion system. Fleet Analytics collects that data, puts it in a cloud system, and makes it available as reports and analysis for the users on board and ashore, and turns the data into knowledge. And both of these technologies are also AI enablers, because FuelOpt collects the data, so it sort of creates the big data. Fleet Analytics helps you turn it into knowledge, but also the knowledge you have once you, your AI system has decided this is the perfect speed to go at, you can feed that straight back into FuelOpt and get the system to keep the speed or consumption or energy output you want. So very briefly, what is FuelOpt? We call it automation made simple. It's an on-top system that controls other systems on board. And it's a fairly simple interface on the bridge where once you've activated, you can control speed through water or over ground, uh, fuel consumption and or engine output, which is a way better way to, or to control the vessel propulsion than the usual way. The usual way is you have a lever controlling RPM of the main engine. That will give you constant RPM, but it won't give you constant consumption. It won't save you from getting over consumption in bad weather. So how it works, there are two main features. One, 
the thing you want to do is to have constant uh, speed or consumption through your voyage because speeding up on a ship uh, increases fuel consumption dramatically. So you want to make sure you keep that down. Thus, you want to have little variation. And this is where fuel up can help you get the variation down and get steady and predictable shaft power. Also, if you have a controllable pitch propeller, the system automatically sets the pitch and the engine RPM to match the parameters you've set. This gives you a fuel saving immediately because usually this is sub-optimized. And optimizing that can give you fuel savings up to over 15% on uh, vessels with controllable pitch propellers. Next step, next product is fleet analytics, which we talk about when turning vessel data into knowledge. Fleet analytics is a cloud-based system that can collect data mainly from fuel up, that's where we started, but it can also collect data and send data to other systems. So it is the, uh, the data collection point on the uh, schedules I showed before, where you get all the vessel data in, you get it in a useful format, you can export it to other systems or have the vessel uh, fleet analytics interface to go in and get your reports, do your analysis and so on. Very briefly, the, it does a couple of things, gives you a fleet overview. This is an example where you can see your fleet, how it's performing, where the ships are. Very good for an operational uh, role as an example. On the reporting side, uh, you can get fairly detailed voyage reports. You can get automated MRV reports and get that done simply. And for the analysis, you can compare ships, you can compare voyages, you can get updated baselines on the vessel performance. So next step, AI. Again, I mentioned this before, that AI goes beyond traditional analytics by being able to see patterns and to filter out disturbances by, by taking in a lot of data and being able to see, as an example, how does wind affect your ship? How do, how do waves affect your ship? Is there a better way to go against bad weather with wind and waves? An AI system can get that. Trying to filter that out from the data manually is going to be very, very difficult. And what it's good for is it helps you predict. If you start building a digital twin of your vessel, which is what an AI model does, basically, you can use that to start in as an input to your voyage plan. If you know the weather going forward from forecast, if you know and how the ship behaves in different wave heights, different weathers, you can get much better predictions on how the ship will behave during the upcoming voyage and thus plan the voyage in a way that will save you the most amount of fuel and still get you there in time and all the other aspects. So it gives you a lot more power on the forecasting side. Also, one interesting thing with AI is that it can change the knowledge gap a little bit. I think for the commercial market, we're going to see some big changes in this decade when it comes to the power of the companies that commercially have enough data to draw conclusions. They will be able to earlier see trends in the markets and position the ships or do their trades according to that. And that could actually change the, the power balance quite a bit in the shipping markets. Looking at what we do with fuel opt and fleet analytics, we are sort of setting the scene to be able to be, get a bare AI system on top of that. We are working with different AI system and machine learning companies to help them with the data and see how we can integrate our services. So that's something we're working on when it comes to voyage prediction, voyage planning, uh, route optimization and ETA simulation. So coming to the end of this, our call is that our planet can't wait. We need to save fuel and we need to lower CO2 emissions. One tool to do that is digitalization with the goal of saving fuel. One very important thing I want to mention as well when talking about this is that company culture is something that needs to be part of this. Uh, I've seen firsthand that having the tools is not enough. 
you need to get the organization on board. You need to get the culture to move towards lowering uh, the environmental footprint. And the two tricks in my world to do that is to educate. Make sure everybody knows the tools, knows the systems, knows how to use them. And one way of doing that is showing the results, making sure the feedback loop goes back. The crew on board can see we did this and this was the effect, i.e. we are helping save the future. So you need to get the culture and you need to get the education level in there. And that is the end of my presentation. And I thank you very much for listening in. And I'm now looking forward to hearing from you one. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Mikhail. Um, it was really interesting to hear about Lean Marine's technology um, and also fleet analytics as an AI enabler. Um, and it's always really interesting to hear your experiences and practices uh, from the times when you were operating a fleet of tankers um, at Lauren Maritime. So thank you very much. Um, once again, a reminder, if you have any questions for Mikhail, pop them into your Q&A box um, and we'll take them uh, during the Q&A session. Um, so now I would like to uh, move on to our third and final expert speaker. Um, for this final presentation, we are going to be treated to insights into hydrogen fuel cells um, and their use on ships. Uh, considering the long lifetime of ships and with IMO targets to reduce greenhouse gases uh, by 2050 as zero emission vessels may have to set sail as early as 2030. Um, therefore, this is a technology that should really be under close consideration um, right now uh, since IMO targets around emission reductions will likely not be delayed um, due to the pandem pandemic or other global crises. So, uh, Johan, uh, really looking forward to this one. Uh, the speaker platform is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. I hope you hear me and see me well. Uh, I'm going to take you through the, um, some information about PowerCell, our fuel cell technology. I will also talk about, as you said, um, during the lead in the IMO policy for uh, the uh, 2050 scenario that IMO is drawing up, uh, also EDI indexing of, of uh, vessels in relation to that. Uh, I will also take you through a, actually a showcase to show that this is not just mumbo jumbo. We have uh, zero emission vessels around the corner. It's about the time to start developing those solutions now uh, before this decade is over until 2030. So a fuel cell is basically, you're, you're providing it with hydrogen, uh, you have to provide it with fresh air and, and it reacts with uh, the hydrogen over a membrane and, and you get uh, the, the separation of the proton and ele electron uh, and then you get uh, a a, 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 an opportunity for current and, and you can drive any electrical apparatus of, of the, the voltage you get, right? So. Fuel cells are generally modular. You can build them up from 100 kilowatts to multi-megawatt systems just by coupling them together, basically. Um, a few words about hydrogen. It's better to take it early than, than later. I guess you guys are uh, not so acquainted maybe with hydrogen as a bunker fuel, but more of oil, uh, green gas oil and, and heavy fuel oil. Uh, the heavy fuel oil industry, I mean, the, the bunkering of, of oil was taking over uh, from, of course, the, uh, the, the steam machines uh, back in the days. Uh, and the bunker fuel actually merged uh, and, uh, and developed over time as the trading routes were developing over time. So we believe that, that actually hydrogen will take the same route going forward. Uh, it will not be completely maybe carbon free hydrogen in the beginning it will be gradually moving over to what we call renewable hydrogen uh, renewable hydrogen would be from sources uh, from from uh, wind farms uh, that when you split uh, water into to hydrogen that you use the electricity from wind farms when the electricity is very very uh, cheap or actually on negative price tariffs uh, so that scenario going forward uh, would, would point in towards uh, actually hydrogen as a 
very good storage principle for, uh, for energy. Uh, there is actually examples of uh, hydrogen being actually transported uh, shortly. There was a showcase plan for the Olympics in Japan uh, by, by the uh, Japanese government uh, and the project is called Histra. It's actually a bunker vessel of 75 tons of liquid hydrogen being taken from Australia over to uh, Japan uh, as, a, as a bunker scenario. Uh, and the, actually then the, this hydrogen was, was planned to be in, uh, injected into the, the gas distribution network as well as being used for infrastructure and transport. So that's a practical example. Then, of course, along the trading routes, hydrogen is available in refineries in, in, uh, in forms of uh, steam methane reformed hydrogen, which has a carbon footprint, as I mentioned, but still it's better to, if you can transit into a fuel that is possible to transfer into zero emission rather than just staying with carbon as a fuel for, for a very long time and then gradually transit into to something else. We believe that the technology uh, disruption has to become uh, happening, be, be, be happening rather soon. So a little bit about power cell, our heritage. Uh, we are originally a spin out from the Volvo Group uh, back in 1994. Uh, we started our fuel cell journey. Uh, we were developing uh, reforming systems based on diesel reforming into hydrogen. Then we used the hydrogen in the fuel cell system. We saw that the capability of those systems was limited to a few kilowatts of fuel cell power. So to be able to get to the, the volume market, the automotive OEMs, you can see those in the slide here. Uh, you, can, you can name them and, and you, we, we saw that those, those partners, uh, we had to provide them with technology that, that was m way more powerful than the refu uh, reforming system. So basically we developed our stack technology based on a 100 kilowatt uh, fuel cell stack, which is uh, like a uh, carry-on luggage for for a, for a uh, uh, on board a, an aircraft. So it's not a big uh, stack. It's very very powerful for for its size. Uh, and the among the uh, the companies that were extremely interested in this, you you, you can see Daimler and, and Volkswagen. Actually, uh, in the COVID times, uh, Daimler and Volvo uh, signed a a joint understanding and, and formed a joint venture on, on, on fuel cell development at, at the moment. So there is times of, of a crisis, but there's also times of, for reflection and regrouping and disruption of technology. And we see that this really happening right now. And uh, it's, it's really encouraging. The stack technology we uh, developed was really interested, uh, interesting for Bosch as well. So they invested in a license for our stack, uh, the S3 stack. And, and then uh, actually PowerCell has the benefit of, of using that volume growth that we see with Bosch to, to use that same technology in marine business and other segments like stationary and off-road uh, equipment. So basically we see uh, the, the fuel cell uh, technology is a sort of a disruption technology in itself because you're using automotive based technology like more like batteries where you use the same type of cells uh, for maritime use uh, you can use the same type of fuel cell uh, as as you would do on land-based systems also in marine use so that's um, a, a great difference from from uh, what you have today in, in marine propulsion systems where you have custom built machineries um, so the imo greenhouse gas policy um, how will that impact you? Uh, basically, it's two things. The EEDI indexing is one thing. There you have the uh, efficiency of, of vessels. It's been going on for since 2013, 2015, something like that, uh, and, and slowly coming down to, to reasonably low levels. Uh, and then you have the, the tailpipe emissions. Uh, 2050 scenario is that you should be down at 50% uh, uh, tailpipe emissions. So basically, from the, uh, the scenario that you have a, a vessel lifetime of, of 30 years, uh, you will be, uh, have to be looking at zero emission sort of dispersion of your, uh, your fleet, your tonnage uh, already by 2030 and earlier, because you want to try out the new technology, right? Earlier, it has been a lot more about 
fueling something different into the existing machinery, like meth methanol uh, being fueled to, to vessels, the LNG story, where you have converted uh, machinery, but sort of the, the, the main propulsion system and, and the co energy conversion system uh, was, was staying intact. With fuel cells, you're adding something completely different. You're adding a different fuel, but also a different energy conversion system. So this, this takes a while to develop into full-scale megawatt solutions, of course, but it, it's, a, it's a, a, a great advantage when it comes to the, the flexibility of the, of the uh, uh, system. Looking the, a little bit at the, the real impact that this greenhouse gas policy has uh, on the IMO side. Uh, if you look to the left in the graph, you could see the EDI indexing going downwards as, as, we, as, we, as we move along, uh, as well as the, the greenhouse uh, gas the policy will, will hit you as well. We believe that uh, we will have to start building uh, vessels with zero emission uh, already before 2030 and beyond 2030, actually, the majority of new builds and uh, also retrofits will have to become uh, zero emission. And uh, beyond that, uh, you can only uh, only tell if you have a, a nice crystal ball. But we see that uh, obviously there there is many sort of coexisting uh, technologies that that has to, has to help the the environment here towards uh, the the fifty percent scenario. Um, going forward. I'd just like to showcase you um, what's going on. Um, I, I teased you a little bit about the, the, uh, the showcase. Uh, we, we are actually in a development phase of a 3000 kilowatt system. So basically we're gonna have a 120 meter uh, vessel uh, with full uh, fuel cell autonomy on zero emissions sailing by 2023. Uh, this is, of course, a huge undertaking. We will have liquid hydrogen storage fully integrated into the hull. There is a lot of safety aspects with this. Uh, we are involved with class, with uh, municipalities, uh, and, and also actually affecting the, the rules of writing on the IMO level. So um, it's, this is a, a big thing for us at Paracel, but also a great, great opportunity going forward. Um, obviously, the fueling infrastructure for, for this project is very specific, so it's going to be on basically one spot for a fill, uh, and then it's a sailing uh, in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so, and, and we see that uh, this, this, this build of the, of the vessel is actually quite special because we're actually able to bring in the fuel cell system in a very late stage of the building of the vessel. So it's actually quite suitable for like the latest phase when you have done your welding, you're done your paint jobs uh, and you bring in, carry in manually the fuel cell modules and, and bring them all together uh, and uh, put them up and commission them uh, together with class. Um, and it could look like something like on, on this picture where you see you have hydrogen tanks, the cylinders that are laying down connected with fuel cell systems that are paralleled. It's a little bit low resolution, but you can probably figure out how it looks like. And then you have switchboards, DC switchboards, uh, and then controlled systems uh, on that. We have gas safety systems, uh, automatic shutdown if there is any leakage, uh, those type of scenario planning has to be done. Uh, the, the vessel we're looking at here is by far the largest vessel ever built uh, with, with fuel cell systems and, uh, and worth to be noted also completely integrated into the hull. So three megawatts for this uh, could by a couple of, of, uh, of years uh, to come, we would be able to reach uh, easily the, the nine or 10 or 12 megawatt you'd need for a, an oil tanker, for instance, uh, for slow steaming. So. Um, we believe in, in this uh, development for the future and hope uh, that you have understood that now is the time to reflect. It's the time to really look at what's coming in the years to come. Of course, you need to save your business as well. Um, but yeah, time to act. And over to Catherine, I'll leave you with this. Thank you very much. 
great. Uh, and thank you, Johan, and, and congratulations to PowerCell for securing that contract uh, for hydrogen fuel cell deployment on a 120 meter vessel. Um, it represents huge strides being made uh, for hydrogen fuel cell use um, in the shipping industry uh, in the coming years and, and decades. Um, and so that concludes our uh, speaker presentation. So now it's time to put your questions to your speakers. Um, we've had a lot of questions coming in um, and you can continue to post your questions uh, during this session um, of the webinar as well. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll take the first question um, is for Mikhail um, off, off the back of uh, your market outlook presentation. Um, and so the question is, uh, what do you think about the prospects for older ships? Um, and do you foresee an increase of, of the scrapping of older vessels, which might limit the prospects of green um, and clean technology upgrade conversions? on the existing fleet. Sorry, Catherine, could you just repeat the last of that question? It cut out for me, unfortunately. Oh, yes, sure. Um, and actually, uh, so Philip and Johan, uh, can you put yourselves on to mute um, just to reduce the background noise? Perfect. I'm having some problem with that, but I heard the first part of the question. So I'll start responding to that and maybe we can get back to okay, the last perfect. part. Thank you. Uh, there you're back, Catherine. I believe that what we're going to see is it's going to be uh, scrapping is going to be very dependent on the market as such, and not necessarily on the other environmental regulations for the next couple of years. But going to 2030 and even more importantly, 2050, that is all of a sudden going to be a very big gateway to get through for an older ship with old technology. So definitely we are going to see scrapping be reinforced by the regulations coming in. Uh, my belief is that it's going to be a very crass economical calculation. Is it worth putting scrubber, ballast, water system, whatever it is on board this ship, or is it better to scrap it? build a new one with better fuel economy and do that. So it's going to be very based on where the oil price and the regulation goes. But we have seen uh, earlier when new regulation comes into force that usually scrapping doesn't really happen immediately when the regulation comes into force. But as soon as the market uh, changes a little bit, like oil prices going up or down, then it actually come, happens. So I believe the effect will be there might not be as dramatic as huge, huge scrapping in just a couple of years, uh, but it will it will be there because the regulations coming out are very clear that you need to have environmentally sound ships. Uh, Catherine, could you repeat the second part of that question, or yeah. did I get it in there? <laughs> um, I think so. I'll just repeat it just in case there's anything you want to add. Um, so the second part of the question was. Do you foresee an increase um, of old ships scrapping, which might limit uh, the prospects of uh, green or clean technology uh, upgrades conversions on the existing fleet? So I guess that last part is uh, about the uh, ha will uh, clean technology upgrades on the existing fleet be limited uh, due to more scrapping? Uh, if I understand the question correct, I think the retrofit industry for sustainability uh, technology is definitely going to be there. There are a lot of ships out there that do not, that can benefit. There are a lot of low hanging fruits to pick for existing ships to get fuel efficiency up, get operational efficiency up. So I don't foresee that as an issue for the technology company, for the suppliers of this technology. I believe even though scrapping picks up, there's going to be a lot of ships where there is a lot of room for improvement still. It's good to see that a lot of the more forward thinking shipping operators are doing a lot today, but there's still plenty of ships on the water where there's a lot to do, basically. Great, thank you. A uh, great answer. Um, and so uh, next I'll, I'll uh, put a question to Philip. 
uh, on the anti-fouling um, coating side. Um, so, Philip, the question is, um, if uh, a vessel has been laid up immediately after dry dock, um, ha after being freshly painted in, in dry dock, how long would you expect uh, the coating to last? Um, and I guess also uh, uh, within that question is, you know, how long would the selectope uh, inside the coating protect uh, that vessel against barnacle fouling um, when it's just come out of uh, the dry dock? Okay, th thank you for the question. And, and uh, if, if the situation is such that it's a newly paint, painted and then going into to a warm layup over extended time, so of course the situation is a lot better than going into a warm layup without coating. Uh, the, the ex how long the, the protection will last will obviously depend on what coating that has been selected. We have seen extraordinary performance on, on all of these paint makers mentioned in my presentations during outfitting periods, which are then very long periods of, of a static performance um, or static exposure. And eight months, even beyond 12 months uh, has been observed in those conditions, but those are normally quite special coatings. So if you're lucky, you have selected a, a, such a coating uh, and that, then there's a very high likelihood you will have a lo very long uh, survival time of the ability to resist uh, marine fouling. So, so it really depends on what coating uh, that was uh, used on the ship. But of course, all the selective coatings will provide an extended idling uh, time uh, compared to any other uh, coating or coating technology. Perfect. Thanks, Philip. Um, and also just uh, one additional question, which um, actually combines a few uh, questions that we've had in, uh, which is around hull cleaning. Um, and so if a vessel has suffered from barnacle fouling um, while being idle, um, is it a case that a, 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 a ship operator can um, clean that vessel whilst it's in the water? Um, can it be removed during uh, routine maintenance um, in the port, so hull grooming? Um, or do other, um, do other uh, methods have to be deployed for, for barnacles uh, if you have them on your ship and their removal? Uh, very good. For, uh, cleaning uh, becomes uh, uh, very problematic once you start to get hard fouling on, on your ship. Uh, it, it is obviously possible to clean, but the measures used will deteriorate the underlying coating to, to uh, make it un, not, not performing uh, anymore or at least at any good level uh, after that kind of cleaning. So once that is applied, the coating will not perform and you're looking forward to a more intense uh, cleaning scheme altogether or, or, or you have to reschedule your, your next dry docking opportunity. So barnacles is, can be removed, but it, is, it has severe consequences on, on, on the underlying uh, anti-fouling coating. Slime, on the other hand, is easier to, to deal with from a coating perspective. Uh, there are sophisticated cleaning systems out there to, to manage that. Um, Grooming is another thing. Grooming is uh, something you do regularly, constant, uh, continuously. And if you have such a robot and, and you use it every day, of course, that's one way of, of, of stay clear of problems. There are surfaces on the ship that won't uh, be covered by such robots, so you still need to think through that. Uh, but, but very many uh, uh, ships do not have that kind of robots uh, available. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, sophisticated, sophisticated coating is um, preferred. And if you have one of the better ones, uh, hopefully then containing selectop, that's probably the best protection you can have. And then obviously combine slime uh, removal with a, with a robot uh, system. If, if it's idling goes on too long, that, that would be the idle, uh, optimal situation. Perfect, thank you, Philip. Um, and then <clears throat> a question for Mikhail uh, Limery. Uh, does FuelOpt uh, have a role in other projects uh, like wind power technologies and hybrid vessels? Yes, it does. Uh, fuel up works to control the propulsion system, and that means it can take, it can work with the optimizer load between many different systems. So you could have different energy sources, like power cells or hy hydrogen cells giving power to the propulsion, and a diesel engine, and wind power, and so on. So it does perform that. Uh, 
that managing of different power sources in. And at the same time, of course, it also manages the propeller to get that uh, working right. And this is something that we believe will be an interesting part going forward when the ships start looking at wind assisted uh, power and, of course, hydrogen assisted power as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, and a, a nice segue there into uh, hydrogen fuel cells. So, Johan, um, a question uh, for you is uh, who will be the early adopters of hydrogen fuel cell? technology um, and will it be a financially viable solution uh, for the cargo shipping sector? I think it will be uh, taking uh, some, a while before it actually becomes a viable option for the, the cargo industry. Obviously hydrogen today is, is rather expensive. Uh, so the early adopters will be uh, short sea shipping or short uh, ferries, PAX ferries, where you have two, two, three hundred packs, uh, maybe on a, on a high speed vessel. Uh, typically the, the projects we are working with, which are on sort of financed right now is in the uh, more of a luxury segment. Uh, I think you could tell that from my presentation. Uh, but it's obviously also a segment which is likely to, to uh, want some disruption. They want to build something different. Uh, they want to stick out uh, and to feel something new. And maybe want to demonstrate that it's possible to do. Uh, so if I'm going to have a quick guess, uh, maybe in, a, in a, like a eight to, to ten years period, we will have more uh, implementation into more commercially profiled vessels, of course. Um, then uh, it's a matter of, of lifetime of the hydrogen systems. It's a matter of, of uh, maintaining them uh, in, a, in a good way. It's a matter of the hydrogen price, obviously, as well as the infrastructure growth. Um, the, the infrastructure growth is going to be point to point. So you, you have to have fixed route uh, to, to get it in, into operation, of course. Was that answering your questions uh, fairly yeah. well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Johanna. So my first question, uh, Johan, seeing as uh, you were the last uh, speaker on the podium, uh, I'll put the first question to you. Um, and the question is, how does PowerCell uh, foresee the bunkering infrastructure for hydrogen fuel supply developing? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a very relevant question. I think I sort of touched on the subject. Uh, I will uh, recap a bit. The uh, infrastructure is obviously fixed route ferries, rope packs, Roro, uh, those type of applications, uh, PAX ferries, uh, high speed ferries, for instance, like they use in Norway on the archipelagos. Uh, those type of vessels where you, we can have a fixed infrastructure, those are most likely to be early adopters. Even fixed point, just one point filling uh, is, is uh, obviously like for luxury vessels like super yachts, uh, where you can have the first uh, adopters. Uh, and then of course, uh, expanding into the more global context of trade, then when you have to have bunker along the, the trade routes, that's the, the, that's the big story where you have also coming with that, the energy transition. I mean, the, the whole energy sector has, has to sort of come out of oil and come into something new, like electrofuels, for instance. So it's long story short, um, but uh, that's how I see it. Perfect. Uh, thank you. And uh, just another question um, for you, Johan Ebb. Uh, this question is, has PowerCell left the automotive industry um, and, and that's trucks and also cars, or are you still uh, very active within those uh, transport sectors? I would say we are still very active on our stack and uh, stack development teams. Uh, they, are, they are involved deeply into the automotive sector. The uh, system building around the stack, you have to com make complete system around it. Uh, that's where we are going now with the rest of the company, so to, so to speak. So uh, those sectors where you have large power needs, like in maritime and stationary 
equipment, uh, backup power systems for, for server holds, for instance. Uh, those type of applications we are targeting with our solutions going forward. Perfect, thank you. Um, and uh, Johanna, I'll give you a little rest. I'll, I'll move on to uh, Mikhail. Um, and so Mikhail, uh, my first question uh, for you from uh, the audience is, um, you mentioned that FuelOpt is uh, an automation system that can apply orders from an AI system. Um, is it possible to overrun it? Yes, definitely is. Uh, safety is very important and that's one of the features that's definitely built into the system that if the ridge crew decides for whatever reason that they want to have manual control or want to do something different then just turn off the system and it's back to manual control or if you even if you just pull the rpm lever in any direction it's going to cut out our system our automated system and go back to the manual system and that is something that's extremely important for safety reasons because you can't start turning systems on when you get into a, uh, a quick situation where you need to act quickly so yes Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then just one other question, um, and I guess this is more of a practical question. Um, how difficult is uh, the fuel opt hardware to install on a vessel, um, and, and how long does the installation typically take? It's not very difficult. Uh, the things that are needed is basically two cabinets, one on the bridge, one in the engine room, that needs to be installed, not very big ones and also the uh, control panel on the bridge. You thus need uh, cabling between those and you need to connect all your in signals to that. So if you have all the meters you need on board, that's basically what needs to be done. So it can be done at the normal port call or even while trading. Uh, usually we do retrofits, meaning that you will need a few more meters, like fuel meters and shaft torque meter. And that is, of course, additional installation time, but it's still something you can easily do during a port call. So uh, we don't require any dry docking or any off time in most of the cases. It's an easy installation. Perfect, thank you. Um, and one of the questions actually uh, that's come in, I guess uh, this gives an opportunity for Johan and um, for Mikhail to answer perhaps. Um, the question is, is there an opportunity for Lean Marine um, and PowerCell to collaborate um, in building a better future? Um, and I guess the, the underlying question here is, are the two technologies offered by your companies compatible um, in any way? I don't know who's, who's yes. She sees the app. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, I would say yes. Fuel up as a system is basically a power balancing system and a control system. So it's built for being able to manage several different propulsion sources. So having a main engine that runs on heavy fuel oil plus. Uh, power cell technology, i.e. Uh, power packs, plus, uh, for an example, wind power is no problem for the system to handle. That's exactly what it does. So it can come in and work very nicely with energy cells and with other type of power sources as well. So that is my answer to it. Yeah, uh, allow me just to tap in. I think uh, actually power uh, optimization of uh, you know power levels is very important for fuel cells to be on the right sort of spot on the curve uh, on the power curve so you increase the efficiency of the fuel cell system you can save a lot of hydrogen a lot of fuel uh, by doing that so yes definitely we we would have something to do in the future and together Perfect, thank you both. Um, and, and just uh, touching upon a question actually that was uh, asked in this morning's webinar, um, and that's uh, to Mikhail, um, is the fuel op technology um, suitable for use 
for vessels using uh, wind propulsion um, assisting technology um, and other green propulsion systems? Uh, definitely. Again, it's one of the things it does is power balancing. Uh, usually in most applications between propeller and engine and getting that balance right. But it can definitely work with uh, other power sources like fuel cells, again, like wind power or wind assisted propulsion. So it would it is a good match with a system using several different power or propulsion sources like a flatner rotor, some fuel cells and possibly the traditional main engine uh, that is oil run. So yes, it is a good ma match for that. Perfect, thank you. Um, and um, Mikhail, I'll, I'll give you a small break um, and I'll move on to Philip. Uh, we have some questions, um, a lot of questions actually coming in um, for you. And so I'll take a, a slightly longer one first. Um, uh, so I'll just check, can you hear me okay, Philip? I believe so, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, the question is, um, some argue that all of these trade changes and disruptions will affect the efficiency of vessels um, and the anti-fouling coatings currently applied. Um, if trade changes uh, become the new normal, um, do you think that this will influence the choice of uh, new technologies and the types of anti-fouling coatings uh, going forward? Uh, yes, if we think that uh, the new, this situation is going to affect the, the new future, then I think the answer is yes, for the simple reason that it clearly shows that there uh, will be less of a, a Formula One activity, so to say, where everything is uh, super well planned out and uh, uh, port calls are responded to directly and all that. There will be a lot more uncertainty in that whole chain and a lot more of of risk of getting stuck somewhere uh, and then being exposed to these uh, longer idling periods. On top of that, we whatever we do, we will have an increasing water temperature and, and, and a global heating effect uh, that is further increasing the fouling pressure. So, so if this just continues on, uh, hopefully going back to some sort of better economy after all, still I think that uh, a, a very powerful anti-fouling coating is going to be so much more interesting um, uh, moving forward and applicable to a lot of different vessels. Perfect, thank you. Um, and another question, Philip, um, is you mentioned um, the uh, vessels are idling um, under threat from barnacle fouling. Uh, where are the zones um, where barnacle fouling is the biggest threat? Well, there are so-called, or I at least call them, barnacle paradises here and there in the world that we've been reported uh, from paint makers to exist. Uh, could be South uh, South America's coast uh, outside of Brazil. Uh, uh, virtually speaking, uh, tropical areas are are a constant challenge because of the the, the the temperatures and the sunlight that sometimes even reflected from from the bottom of the of the sand bed, which causes then a, a more diverse fouling pressure on also the flat bottom. So uh, areas where there's no sunlight, nutrition uh, and, and quite a good, decent average temperature around the world are, are certainly areas where ships will have much more trouble with, with uh, uh, fouling unless they have uh, strong anti-fouling products, of course. Should be mentioned that that's also the areas where most ships tend to, to, to trade today because globalization grows. Uh, these countries uh, where populations are large and those are Southeast Asia, uh, South America and so on, which are all are located in these kind of areas. So the, that's a big shift uh, that we need to consider moving forward. Perfect. Uh, and thank you for that answer, Philip. Um, and I think actually uh, we have run out of time for answering uh, any other questions now during this live uh, webinar. Um, and so I would like to reassure anyone that if you did ask a question, um, we will come back to you um, with an answer from our experts um, by the mail uh, address that you provided uh, when you signed up to this webinar. Um, and so 
since our webinar um, is complete and we heard from all of our experts um, and also the market outlook, um, I would like to say a big thank you uh, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you found this webinar really interesting and useful. Um, I'd also like to thank our experts um, who have made their presentations not once but twice. Um, and, and, and so that's really uh, great. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available um, on the uh, respective company websites of uh, iTech, Lean Marine and, and, and PowerCell. And, uh, so we will be sharing those within the next few days. Um, and so uh, all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. Uh, stay safe um, and have a really great day. Thanks a lot.